Well, it's a pleasure to have our friend Newt Gingrich with us. He's got a fantastic new book, March to the Majority, which is coming out, uh, I guess, tomorrow, right, Newt? Yeah, it'll be out tomorrow morning. We're very excited by it. It's very exciting. March to the Majority, Newt Gingrich. Now, this is how you took over the House, how you got the votes, how you pulled it together, how you became the leader. Tell us why this is important today. Well, I think we're faced with a lot of the same problems. You know, how how do you listen to the American people well enough to build a sustainable majority? Remember, we weren't just the first Republican majority in 40 years, but two years later we became the first re-elected Republican majority since 1928. And the system that we built lasted until 2006, had a brief four-year interruption, and came roaring right back in 2010. So you you could argue that the 94 election and, and the the way we approach things, the way we got things done, permanently shifted power in Washington in a way that nobody would have expected because no one prior to the election thought that the Republicans had a chance of being a majority. I think second, it's really important, uh, think of it almost as a playbook, because um, March the Majority will lays out how we negotiated with Bill Clinton and arouse public opinion so that we got welfare reform, uh, the largest single conservative reform in our lifetime. We got the largest capital gains tax cut in history, launching an entire extraordinary period of entrepreneurial growth. We cut regulations dramatically, helping small businesses, and uh, we balanced the federal budget for four consecutive years uh, for the only time in your lifetime. So uh, there are a lot of lessons. You know, we, we didn't do this because we, we're lucky we did it because we worked very hard. We learned over a 16-year period from 1978 to 1994 what worked and what didn't work. And in March, the majority, I'm giving people a chance to learn exactly in a free society, what are the principles that work? How do you put together a majority? And then how do you use that majority to get the policy changes you want? That, that's why I think March, the majority is very relevant for today, not just as a history book. And do you get the sense that the Republicans in the House, McCarthy and others, are following the game plan pretty much? Well, I certainly think in the negotiations with Biden on the debt ceiling, there's no question that McCarthy outmaneuvered Biden dramatically. I mean, Biden thought he was going to get a debt ceiling with no cuts, no reforms, uh, and it turned out that only one out of every four Americans favored that. We, One of the projects I work on is called the America's New Majority Project, which has been doing very extensive polling since 2018. And people can see it at americasnewmajorityproject.com. And it was clear that only one out of every four Americans favored Biden's position. Well, in that kind of a setting, you're, you're going to lose if the other side has the courage to stand firm. And, um, you know, the fact is that for over 100 days, uh, McCarthy kept saying, and he went to the news media, he got more press coverage. If you go back and look at it, it's amazing how clear he was in communicating through the media, despite their liberal bias, because he just kept saying over and over, you know, we want to get this solved. And the key there was that the House Republican Conference actually passed a debt ceiling bill with real reforms. And therefore, the Senate Republicans, to my great shock, uh, came out and said, we are for McCarthy. And Mitch McConnell, who negotiated many of these deals, said, I'm not in this. This is McCarthy's opportunity. We're going to back McCarthy. And that put him in a position. And, and the reason I think this really matters in the long run, Mark, is if the center of gravity in Washington becomes the House Republicans, they are the most conservative group in the city, uh, much more conservative than the Senate and obviously dramatically more conservative mm -hmm. than the Biden White House. Now the question will be between the investigation process and the effort that they're going to put into the appropriations bills, can they build on this? I, I tell everybody, if, if the debt ceiling was the final fit deal, uh, I, I would have voted no. But if it's the first step in setting up a rhythm of winning so we keep getting more and more and more goodies, then it's a very important yes. And I say that because if you read March the Majority, you'll figure out, you know, we didn't, get, we didn't jump to a balanced budget, we had three years of constant work, gradually inch by inch, 
getting Clinton in a position where a balanced budget became possible. I think in this case, I don't think Biden's going to last three years. So the question is, can we get through 2023, 2024, and be in a great position in January of 25 with a Republican president, Republican House, Republican Senate, to really drive dramatic, bold, deep forms? And I think that's the great challenge for our generation. Now, you talked about a new kind of campaigning in the book. What did you mean by that? Well, it's really what we learned from Ronald Reagan. I mean, people tend to forget Ronald Reagan was an FDR Democrat. As late as 1948, he was running commercials for Harry Truman and for Hubert Humphrey. He became an independent in 52, headed up Democrats for Eisenhower. And by the late 50s, he had become a Republican. But he remembered the key differences. An FDR Democrat thought they were the natural majority. They had the confidence, the optimism, the belief that they represented the American people. And, and Reagan understood what Lincoln had said when Lincoln said, with popular sentiment, anything is possible. Without popular sentiment, nothing is possible. And if you read, as, I, as I've done many times, uh, Reagan's farewell address in January of 1989, he says very clearly, these great victories weren't mine. These great victories were yours. It was your, vo- your vo- voice, your calling, your involvement, you, the American people. And so we tried to return to that model. Big ideas in the contract with America that were all 70% or more in popularity, willingness to fight over the ideas. People forget, you know, this wasn't you know, a picnic. Uh, we closed the federal government twice, once for 26 days. Uh, we, we were in a knockdown, drag out brawl. And I, I always laugh at the media that says, oh, this really hurt the Republicans. We became the first reelected majority since 1928 after we closed the government. Mm -hmm. And the reason was people thought we were being principled and the people thought that we were serious. We weren't normal politicians. Uh, In in many ways, the strength that Trump brought in the the sense that he wasn't just a regular politician. Uh, And I think that my, my goal is to get Republicans to understand that the consultant class doesn't understand the American people, doesn't respect them, and doesn't study issues, and they they make a living out of running junk negative commercials uh, that frankly weaken the whole country. And what you need is a much more Reagan style popular appeal, which which can be very tough with your opponent, by the way. Ray, Reagan, you know, beat the tar out of Jimmy Carter, uh, but it was positive; it wasn't negative. Don't 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 uh, hang up. No, we want to keep you for another segment here. The book is March to the Majority. You can get it at Amazon.com. Order it now. It'll show up tomorrow morning. You know, I first learned about Newt Gingrich when my older brother bought and gave to me many decades ago, Newt, your first book. And it was fantastic. And uh, this book is, I have to say, one of your best. March to the Majority, Newt Gingrich. And uh, you feel like Kevin McCarthy really is doing a very good job of doing that. I mean, he's got a, you had a much, much bigger majority. is a tiny majority. And he's got all these elements within his party that he has to pull together, right? Right. And, and, but he's also, he's picked fights that are really interesting. You know, when, in our America's New Majority Project, we found that 84% of the American people believe parents have the right to know what's happening to their children in school. So one of the first bills that McCarthy moved was a parental rights bill. And the Democrats, like little lemming, marched straight off the cliff and voted no. But in fact, eight out of every 10 Americans think that what the Republicans were doing was right. And he's been very methodically going through a whole series of issues where the country thinks the Republicans are right. And the polling numbers now show it. I mean, uh, a majority of Americans, a substantial majority, wanted spending cuts on the debt ceiling. So McCarthy was, uh, frankly, outmaneuvering Biden with Biden's help on two fronts. One was McCarthy was advocating spending cuts. Biden was opposed. The other was McCarthy would say every morning, I really want to negotiate. And Biden would say, we're not going to negotiate. Well, the country is so sick and tired of politicians bickering that it was a dead loser so Biden had a double negative. Uh, he wanted a bill people didn't want, and he didn't want to talk about it, and everybody wanted negotiation. And I think that the press corps on Capitol Hill uh, was, was really shocked. I think they had 
so underestimated McCarthy and misunderstood the nature of, of the 15 votes that got him to be Speaker. Now, he's always going to have a hard time. You, you, you're never going to do quite enough for the most conservative and most activist members uh, because they don't care about negotiating. They don't care about the balance of power. They know what they want, and they like it Tuesday morning, preferably served, you know, with, with coffee and cream. Um, but for most Americans, the fact that he got something done, the fact that it's the first debt ceiling in history where we actually cut spending, and we did cut domestic discretionary spending substantially. Uh, it would have been – it was a bigger number on the domestic side, but they put some money back in for defense and some money back in for veterans. Uh, and so – it, the number's not as big as it looked, would have been on a net basis. But they also changed a lot of rules. Uh, they had very dramatic regulatory reforms and uh, very, very dramatic uh, reforms in terms of infrastructure and natural gas and oil and the kind of developments we need. And they, could, they did cut out all of the new IRS agents for this year. Uh, and I think you're going to see them come back in the appropriations bills with a series of cuts that are well, you know, th think of the agreement on the debt ceiling is a ceiling, not a basement. The Republicans in the House can come back and cut substantially below that. My my personal favorite is killing the $3.5 billion uh, FBI headquarters, which would be, oh, yeah. phys would be larger be larger than the Pentagon. I cannot imagine a worse idea. God forbid. I mean, they're so out of control. He really is underestimated, though, isn't he? They didn't think he'd be Speaker... Uh, and then he's speaker. They didn't think he'd be an effective communicator. He's extremely effective. And they didn't think he'd be able to out-negotiate Biden. And Biden was hoping that he would crumble, you know, with the backing of the Senate Republicans, frankly. And he simply didn't. Does he Does yeah. he consult with you often and ask you your advice no, and so I, forth? I, I, look, we chat, but I, I want to give Kevin credit for him just who he is. He is the best people-oriented speaker I've ever seen. He likes people. He talks to everybody. Uh, he has an amazing memory for, for people. Um, and that's an enormous advantage in that job. I um, mean, somebody like Paul Ryan may have been more of a policy wonk, but Ryan didn't have the political skill. And if you're going to be Speaker of the House, you have to have some ability to reach out to human beings and to talk to human beings. Uh, Kevin also thinks very strategically. I mean, I was very struck as an example that he had professors coming down from MIT to brief members of the House on artificial intelligence in the middle of the the vote on uh, the the deficit on, on the uh, debt ceiling, and, and he had been thinking about this for several months because he thinks this is a very big long-term issue that none of us really understand, and he wants the members themselves to get educated. Well, that that's a kind of strategic leadership that I think is pretty darn impressive. They've created a China committee, which we desperately needed. Uh, that committee is going to provide real leadership on what's it going to take for America to successfully compete with China. They've backed uh, uh, the uh, Oversight and Investigations Committee in some very tough knockdown drag out fights with the FBI and the Justice Department and the White House. So a lot of these things going on simultaneously. You talk about this in the book, you become the leader, and you're under attack. And in fact, the more, I remember all this. The more effective you were, the more brutally you saw. You had Bond, you're constantly filing complaints against you. Is this one reason that you can see in Donald Trump what they're doing to him? That is, whatever they can do to kneecap him? Oh, look, look, and I think eventually McCarthy will have the same treatment. I was a mortal threat to their system. They, they were in such a state of shock the day after the election to so, suddenly be in the minority. None of them thought they would be. They knew it couldn't be their fault, therefore I was evil. And only an evil Newt Gingrich could have done this terrible thing to the liberal Democrats. Trump is the same way. We, we now realize that, that, that Trump had virtually the entire national establishment prepared to lie about him, prepared to engage in criminal behavior. I mean, the stuff we're learning from the Durham report and from other sources, it's, it's astonishing how much was, how many laws were broken by the left and how much places like the New York Times and the Washington Post were active partners in smearing a, a, a president of the United States with total falsehoods. 
I mean, not not even close. Total, complete falsehoods. And I, one of the reasons I admire Trump is, after all these years of getting beaten up on behalf of the American people, he's still standing there. You know, he's still fighting. He's he's still prepared to take on the entire establishment. And I think that historians will look back on this as just a remarkable personal ability. I think they'll also look back on it maybe 100 years from now as the most contemptible and diabolical period in modern American history because if it's not one thing, it's another. Now documents, they want to indict them over documents. You step back and you look at this and you say, what the hell? You're going to try and take out the leading Republican right now for the presidency? The Democrats, Biden administration? Over documents? Why? Did, did he sell something to somebody? You know, I can tell you when I was chief of staff to Attorney General Meese, he would have picked up the phone and called and said, hey, give me this stuff so we don't have a problem. You know, it would have been worked out. You wouldn't have this. And then you have Bill Barr on Fox constantly like he's campaigning for him to be indicted. What do you make of that? Well, I think there's some real bitterness there. I mean, it's you know, look, if, if you were an establishment Bush Bush Republican, uh, and you watched him annihilate Jeb Bush, uh, and he, which he did. I mean, Bush was the front runner until he ran into Donald Trump, and then he disappeared. Uh, and if you represent a kind of genteel, organized country club corporate Republicanism, almost everything about Trump just sets your teeth on edge. He clearly appeals to blue collar workers. He represents a new emerging Republican Party which is really a working class party. It's not a party of skull and bones and Yale and Harvard. Uh, and if you're skull and bones and, you know, you, 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 you've you learned how to be genteel and use the right fork and the right spoon, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> it drives you nuts. I mean, who does this guy think he is leading? Well, ha- happens to be for a vast majority of Americans what they think we need to take on a corrupt, uh, incompetent and dangerous establishment. Now, let me ask you this. In terms of uh, you have here with Joe Gaylord, Joe Gaylord's been with you a long time, hasn't he? Tell everybody who he is. Well, Joe, Joe Gaylord was the head of the Congressional Campaign Committee. Uh, he, he and I started working together uh, in the early 80s. We both actually got involved in politics uh, when we were much younger. And uh, without his help, we could never have created the contract with America. We could never have grown the majority and it's important for people to remember, this is one of the key points of, of March to the majority. We tried in 80, 82, 84, 86, 88, 90, and 92, and failed. And it wasn't that we were rope-a-doping. We were failing. We were doing everything we could. But every year we'd learn some new things. We'd try out some new things. And we gradually grew both a big enough party and a clear enough understanding of what worked and what didn't work. And I would say literally without Joe's help, uh, it would have been impossible. So I in a way, I was, I was Mr. Inside and he was Mr. Outside. You know, I was the guy who gave the speech. He was the guy who organized and trained the campaign workers. We created an, an, a campaign academy to train an entire generation about how to run campaigns in the Reagan style. Uh, I, we created a GOPAC training tape system with 55,000 people getting a tape every month. I mean, we really worked at educating people and creating a base from which you could actually govern the country and get things done. And I think one of the reasons I decided to write March of the Majority, and Joe agreed with me and helped write it, is that we need to revisit those lessons. We need This is a playbook so that this generation can do the same things because they're not magic. I mean, Lincoln understood it, Reagan understood it, uh, and people can learn how to do this in a way that makes America much more governable uh, and much more capable of uh, cleaning up the corruption and the mess. The book is March... To the majority, Newt Gingrich, I encourage you strongly to get it. You can get it on any of my social sites. We link to it on Amazon. You can go directly to Amazon. You're going to love this book. It's very important. Newt Gingrich is like one of the wise men out there for uh, conservatives and liberty. One more question here, Newt. Do you think the Democrat Party today is much worse than the Democrat Party 30 years ago? Yes, I think it's, it's, it's like a cancer that is that is metastasized. <clears throat> I think they're more anti-American, uh, they're more racist, uh, they're more involved in, in sexual assault in Western civilization. Um, <clears throat> it's astonishing. I mean, 
you go down the list, it's really hard to believe that a great party, uh, although Theodore White in the making of the president in 1972 warned in describing the McGovern problems that the liberal ideology had become a liberal theology. And remember, in the late 60s, we had 2,500 bombings. We had an active campaign to assassinate the police. Uh, so we've been through this before, but I think it's worse today. I think the universities are sicker. They're more totalitarian. They're more willing to drive out anybody who disagrees with them. And I think you have these nutty things like the Target store problems and, and Bud Light and you name it, you know, or the Dodgers bringing in a group of people who are perverted and who are clearly openly anti-Catholic, who dress like nuns to make fun of nuns. I mean, it is it is as sickening and as despicable as anything in American civic culture. It truly is. Newt, I want to thank you very much. March to the majority, folks. Newt Gingrich, I want to strongly encourage you. Grab a copy. You can get it on Amazon.com. It'll show up at your door tomorrow. Every major bookstore will have it starting tomorrow as well. Thank you, my friend, and God bless. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Newt. He's terrific. He really is terrific.